please join me in welcoming Moon and Neil to the stage. Thank you. Ah, okay. Um, the clicker. I'll just. Is there a clicker or no? Ah, yes. I. Well, thank you. This is our first uh, time in Montenegro, so we are very happy that we've been invited. Um, um, I'll start from the beginning. My life, I started, um, well, I was born completely colorblind, so I've never seen color. I've, I have achromatism, which means that I see things in grayscale. So as a child, I tried to ignore the existence of color because I couldn't see color. I didn't want to talk about color, and I didn't want anyone to talk about color. So I tried to ignore color, but it was impossible to ignore color because even if you don't see color, you can't ignore that color exists because people keep mentioning it every single day in elements that have nothing to do with the beauty of color, but like yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, Blue Tag, Red Cross, you can hear the name of a color. It's also Pink Panther, Red Bull, Yellow Submarine, James Brown is in his last name, or this huge country called Greenland. So I kept hearing the names of colors, and it was really annoying. Also when color is used as a code, it can be a bit confusing, like hot water and cold water, sometimes it's only expressed through color, and also maps, I can get uh, sometimes lost. This is fine, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost, because some maps only use color codes. And then when I was a child and I was learning the colors of flags, I had this situation. So <laughs> three countries share exactly the same flag. Also, when I'm talking to people, if someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea, because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. So the reason why I wanted to sense color was not because of the beauty of color. I didn't want to change my sight. The reason was of a social reason. I wanted to have this social element in my life, but I didn't want to change my sight, because to me, seeing in grayscale has many advantages. I have better night vision because people who see in grayscale, we have better night vision. We can see longer distances because color doesn't interfere with our perception of distance. I can memorize shapes more easily because uh, color doesn't distract me from shape. And also photocopies are cheaper in black and white. So this was always an advantage. So I didn't want to change my sight, but I wanted to have a sense of color. And when I was studying music, I'm a pianist, when I was studying piano, I realized that there's been many theories in history relating color and sound. Isaac Newton created a theory in the 1600s where he related each color of the rainbow to a specific musical scale. So I wanted to bring Isaac Newton's theory into practice, and this is why we created in 2003 a system that would allow me to hear the frequencies of color. Each color has a light frequency, and if we could hear the light frequency, we would hear specific musical notes. So red, for example, uh, sounds between F and F sharp, and then orange is a bit higher, so each color has a specific note. And then I memorized the sound of the colors until I was able to distinguish color through sound. So um, I don't know if we are able to uh, hear this. So this is the sound of color. If we could hear the frequencies of light, we would hear these notes. Now we're hearing from red to orange, and then it keeps going up and up. So at the beginning I was hearing colors everywhere, and it was a bit confusing, so I had to learn the names of colors through sound, and slowly I memorized the names of colors through sound, and I was able to distinguish all the colors through sound. So when I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum through sound waves, I didn't see why I should stop there, because there's many more colors in the world that the human eye cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets, so I decided also to include the infrareds and the ultraviolets. So since then I can actually sense more colors than a human eye. Sensing infrared allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can go in a, in a space and tell if the alarms are on or off. So it's interesting to know that in many shops and in many banks, the alarms are actually off, not on. Some of these sensors are not working. Also, ultraviolet perception allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. If I sense there's a high level of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun or I put some sun cream. So my aim is to continuously extend my color perception beyond these limits of the human uh, visual perception. Uh, when I started the project, I didn't want to use technology and I didn't want to wear technology. I wanted to become technology. I wanted to create a new body part 
First, I thought of having a third eye implanted in the middle of my head, but this would limit my color perception to what I have in front. So I thought that the best way would be to design a human antenna that would be implanted inside my head, and this antenna would allow me to feel the vibrations of color inside the skull. So when I designed the antenna, I went to the doctor and I said that I wanted an antenna implanted in my head, and then he said, sorry, we don't do this here. If you want to have this antenna implanted in your head, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee. So I proposed this antenna implant to a bioethical committee and they said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted in my head for three reasons. One, because it's not a pre-existing body part, it's not a leg or an arm, so they didn't find it ethical. Second reason, because it's not a pre-existing sense, sensing infrareds and ultraviolet is not human, so they didn't find it ethical. And the third reason was that they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said no to the surgery, but they helped me find a doctor willing to do the surgery. So I found one in Barcelona, and then this is the surgery. So this is my head facing down. So my head was drilled four times, so I would have four implants. First this, the uh, hair was removed and then the skin was reduced. And then there's four implants. Two are to hold the structure of the antenna. The third implant is this chip that vibrates depending on the dominant color in front of me. So if there's red, the vibration of red goes inside my skull and it vibrates the chip. And then the vibration of the chip becomes an inner sound. So I can actually hear the vibration of red inside my skull and of any other color. And then the fourth implant is internet connection. So I can also receive colors from other sensors, not only from the antenna, but I can also connect my head to other color sensors around the world. So it took two months for the antenna and my head to merge. So now this antenna is also integrated inside my skull. So it's part of my body now, and I'm officially taller as well, because this is part of my body. So I had to get used to the new height as well. The internet connection, I used to receive colors from five different continents. There's five people in the world, five friends, that have permission to send colors directly to my head. So if there's a beautiful sunset in Australia, now my friend from Melbourne can actually start streaming live images from his mobile phone to my head. So I could be here in Montenegro, but I could be sensing the colors of a rainbow in Melbourne. So uh, I see this as the use of the internet as a sense, and I think we will see much more of this in the future, how the internet is not only used as a tool or a communication system, but the internet will also be used as a sense or a sensory extension. If my friends start sending colors at night, they wake me up sometimes, or they color my dreams. So if someone starts sending yellow when I'm sleeping, my dream might suddenly become yellow, or a banana might appear in my dream. So my friends can actually alter my dreams, or they can color my dreams if they send colors at night. I can also use the internet connection to connect to NASA's International Space Station. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer on Earth, but in space. So this allows me to actually explore the colors from space without having to physically go there. I call this becoming a sense astronaut, how we can explore space by sending our senses to space instead of physically going to space. The colors in space are much more uh, Im impressive than here on Earth. I find them much more intense because there's lots of ultraviolets. So it's a very intense experience when I connect to NASA's International Space Station. I don't see this as AI. This is not artificial intelligence. The antenna would be artificial intelligence if it, would, was, it, would, it, if it was giving me the, the names of colors. If the antenna was saying blue, yellow, pink, orange, that would be AI. But this is not AI. The technology is not giving me the intelligence. It's giving me the sense. So I see it as AS, an artificial sense, not AI. So when you merge with AS, the I, the intelligence is created by the brain. So it's up to you uh, if your brain will create knowledge or not when you merge with an artificial sense. I also don't see this as virtual reality or augmented reality. I see it as revealed reality. Merging with technology can allow us to reveal a reality that already exists, but that the human body cannot receive or sense. And infrareds and ultraviolets is an example. Infrareds and ultraviolets exist, but the humans, uh, human bodies cannot sense them. So by merging with technology, we can reveal these realities that already, already exist. So I think we'll start seeing much more projects related to revealed reality in the 2020s.
This is an MRI scan of my brain. I no longer feel the difference between my brain and the software. That's why I feel and I identify as a cyborg. Cyborg comes from two words, cybernetic organism. So I identify as being a cyborg because I feel that I am technology and I feel no difference between the software and my brain anymore. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004 because they said there was a problem with the passport photo that I sent. They said that there's a norm that says electronic equipment cannot be uh, appear on passport photos. So they saw that there was something electronic in the picture and they asked me to remove it. I replied saying that I identified as a cyborg and that this is a body part, not an electronic equipment. And in the end, they accepted this explanation and they allowed me to appear in the first passport in 2004 with the first antenna prototype and then the picture was renewed. So this allows me to travel freely around the world because it's part of my uh, official image of the body now. So I am now in conversations with the Swedish government because all the materials that I used to create the antenna are Swedish. So I'm telling the Swedish government that I am Swedish because part of my body <laughs> is Swedish. So I think that uh, there should be a six point here that says that if you have Swedish body parts, you can also apply for Swedish citizenship. So we'll see what happens if they say yes. We might see that different countries might regulate how many years you need to have a body part, maybe for 10 years, 15 years, and then you might be able to apply for citizenship. My life has changed in many ways. Now that I hear color, I can dress in a way that it sounds good. So depending on how I dress, I sound differently. If I dress completely black, I'm completely silent. If I dress with these three colors, I'm dressed in C major, so that's a happy chord. This is a minor chord, so I would dress like this in a funeral. Or I can also decide what melody to wear. So I can design clothes that sounds like a melody. This is a tie that I designed that sounds like electronic music by Sega Bodega. So when I look at the tie, I hear the electronic music. So the longer the tie, the longer the melody, so I can wear songs. I have also done projects trying to detect the dominant colors of cities because cities are not gray. Cities have dominant colors. I wonder what dominant color Montenegro in, in general has or this city, or, or if different cities have different dominant colors like Madrid is amber terracotta, uh, Libya, um, Lisbon is light yellow and turquoise. So each, each capital or each city has its own dominant uh, colors. Also a change in the way I see interior design is uh, that now I can paint a house so that it sounds good. If I want the living room to sound C major, I paint it blue, yellow, and pink. If I want the floors to have a profound sound, I paint them red because red is uh, the lowest frequency, so it gives a profound sound to the whole house. Exit doors would be green because green is in the middle of the spectrum, so it tunes yourself before you go out in the street. Uh, bedrooms, I would paint them in three colors. Uh, turquoise, which sounds like the note B, uh, violet, which is like the note E, and pink, which is the note D, so you have B, E, D, so you have bed, these three colors, and also the kitchens, I would paint them violet, because violet is the highest color in the spectrum, so it keeps you alert. It's a color that we don't usually eat, so it actually doesn't interfere with food. So hearing color also means that when I listen to music, I feel color, so each note that I hear relates to a color, so I can paint what I hear. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night, note by note, so if I uh, point the antenna here, I can start hearing Mozart's Queen of the Night. So to me, this is a color score, and this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, which looks uh, very different from Mozart. Also, you can transpose speeches into color, because when we speak, we use different frequencies. This is two different speeches. This is a speech by Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream, and this is a speech by Hitler. So it looks very different because they used very different frequencies and different notes when they spoke. This is a sound palette that is used by um, musicians. So I created this so that other musicians could use the color and sound code when they play music. So instead of using a score, they use color. This is a concert where the musicians are using the colors on stage. And if there's blue, they play C sharp. If there's red, they play F, so they can play the colors on stage. And also there's public sculptures that use this color code so that you can download an app and then it's a free app that allows you to use your mobile phone to hear the colors around you. This is also a, a projection that when you use the mobile phone app, you can hear music because the colors keep changing. So this system can now be used to create music through color. Uh, food is a big change as well because when I look at food, I hear different notes, so I really enjoy 
composing music with salads, especially, because salads have many different colors. Um, so I can compose music by looking at things as well. Instead of playing an instrument, I look at different vegetables and fruit, and then I can compose music by just looking at these uh, elements. So to me, walking around the supermarket is like going to a nightclub, because uh, there's so many colors in a supermarket. So just walking around the aisles creates different melodies, and the most exciting area of a supermarket is the cleaning zone. The cleaning department zone is the most exciting area because it has unexpected colors, usually very saturated and very loud. This is just an example of how you can create music by different elements. Things like this sound very unusual because it's uh, usually very bright and unexpected colors. Milk is silent. so. It's not only supermarkets, it's also art museums. I can now listen to a Picasso and I can listen to an Andy Warhol. All painters have become composers, so all painters sound different. I can literally differentiate different paintings by how they sound. This is a chromophone which allows you to go to this restaurant and listen to the food as well. So when you put the food on this plate, you rotate the plate and then you can hear the sound of the, mu of the, of the food. So you can go to this restaurant and ask for some Mozart as main dish or some Lady Gaga dessert. So you can choose what songs you want to eat. So if you have people or children that don't like eating vegetables, maybe they will like eating their salad and vegetables if the salad sounds like their favorite musician. So it's a way of changing the way we perceive things that maybe we, we didn't like. This is an example of how some paintings sound like. I can literally hear the scream. And each painter has its own frequency. The other biggest change is the way I sense people. So when I look at someone's face, I hear their face. So I really enjoy getting close to the face and listening to the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, and the hair. And then I send them an MP3 of their face so they can listen to themselves. I call this sound portraits. One of the first ones I did was of Prince Charles of England. I asked him if I could listen to his face, and this was his reaction when I asked him. <laughs> we all sound different. Uh, Judy Dench has silent hair, for example. James Cameron has a very high-pitched sound of skin. Uh, Moby sounds less than other people because he has no hair, so that's one note less. Marina Abramovic sounds very low frequencies and her lips are very loud. Um, Macaulay Culkin sounds C major, so it's unusual to find someone that sounds like a major chord. Uh, Iris Apple has a very, very high-pitched sound of eyes, so it's unusual to find uh, such high-pitched sound of eyes. Woody Allen sounds very soft, like an old painting. Robert De Niro has a melody in his lips because he has different uh, shades of red, so when uh, you listen to his lips, you hear a melody. Philip Glass sounds extremely microtonal, like his music. And Bono had very loud glasses here, because they were a shade of violet, so very loud glasses. What really shocked me is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they are black, they're actually very, very dark orange, and people who say they are white, they're actually very, very light orange. So that fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false, we are all orange. This is the sound of a face, so you, you can also create face concerts where the audience cues and then I start creating someone music from the eyes, the lips, the hair, creating rhythms of electronic music from the colors of the audience. So if the concert sounds really bad, it's not my fault, it's their fault, because that's where the music is coming from. The last face concert was of Prince Albert II of Monaco. And he likes the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone. So you can also use the sound of your face as a ringtone. So when I started this project in 2003, I had no idea what would happen. The two possible problems was that my brain would reject the sense or that my body would reject the body part, but it didn't happen. Uh, I, my body and my brain accepted the new organ and the new sense. But what really shocked me is the social reaction, having an antenna visible uh, means that for the last 15 years I've been stopped in the street by strangers asking what this is. In 2004, most pop people thought it was a reading light, so they would ask me if I could turn on the light, or they were wondering where my book was. In 2005, people thought it was a microphone chat, a flexible microphone. 
In 2007, people thought it was a hands-free telephone, so they thought that was, I was on the telephone. In 2009, people thought it was a GoPro cam, that I was filming my life. In 2012, 13 people thought I had something to do with Google Street View, and that I was streaming the streets. In 2015, children would ask if this was some kind of extendable selfie stick attached to my body. And in 2016, many people would shout at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. So. Hopefully, in the future, people will think this is an antenna, a human, bo a new body part, basically, and they will ask me what sense it gives me, because I think we will see more people in the street in the 2020s with new organs and new senses. Okay, so I, <laughs> uh, Neil and I are childhood friends, so we actually grew up together, and I always, like, we always talked about how differently we perceive the world, and when he started we, I, I, I usually was the one who was telling Neil the colors of things, and then when he started to experiment with, uh, with antenna, there was a point that he actually knew better the colors, and he had a deeper experience of colors than me. And then I, can, I, got, I got jealous, so I also wanted to experience reality in a different way. And I'm a choreographer, I'm a dancer, so I thought that I wanted to perceive movement in a, in a deeper way, because there's many things that move around us that we cannot experience through our senses. There's lots of imperceptible movement that happens, so I wanted to focus on how could I perceive movement in a deeper way. So my first project was this kind of glove that I would point of people and it would tell me the, the speed of the people walking in front of me. Uh, but that wasn't that cool because I had to point at people and then it was weird. And also it would tell me the speed. So for example, if I would point, it would tell me if it was five per hour, six per hour, three per hour. But that wasn't that cool because I didn't want to know the speed. I wanted to feel the speed. I didn't want to wear technology. I wanted to have a new sense and a new experience of the reality. So in order to do that, with the help of a friend, we transformed this glove into a pair of earrings. So with this, I would feel a vibration. Every time someone was walking from right to left, I would feel a vibration on my right ear and then a vibration on my left ear. And depending on the interval of each vibration, I would know uh, the speed of the people walking in front of me so that I gained the sense of a speed. With this, I, I, I traveled with Neil with different countries to define the capital cities uh, by the speed of the people walking. So I realized that depending where you are, you change the speed of the people that you walk. So you, everyone has this common sense. You would probably walk faster if you are in London than if you are in Rome, because there's like, this tendency. So I wanted to define each capital city of Europe by the speed of the citizens. And after the ex experience, I realized that London is uh, people walk very fast, also Stockholm, they walk very fast. And the slowest capital city I've been in was the Vatican City, basically. There's just one line and no one walks or runs there. Um, after this line, the sensor, after experience this, uh, the movement that I, I, the speed, I decided to turn the earrings around and that gave me like a perception of a 360, 100 degrees of my surroundings. So with this, turning uh, the other side, the earrings, I could feel presence behind me. So all our senses are focused on, on, on the, in front of our body, but in the back of our bodies, we are very dead sensory speaking. So this allowed me to feel if some, someone was getting closer or not. And actually, it's a sense that we give to cars. Some cars can feel if they're getting very close to another car, but actually humans, we, don't, we cannot feel if someone is getting really close. So that changed my, the perception of my surroundings. And after experiencing this for a while, I wanted to perceive some uh, the movement that didn't become uh, from people or from objects. I wanted to perceive a more universal movement. And then I thought, the, like, if I would be alone in the planet, how could I perceive movement? What, what moves that I cannot perceive? And then I realized that the Earth is constantly moving, not only rotates by itself and around the sun, but it, it constantly shakes through earthquakes. So earthquakes, I thought it, it was fascinating because earthquakes are like a, a heartbeat of our planet. It's constant vibrations, but it's a huge movement, but most of the time imperceptible. And then it's when I start since 2013, I decided to, to create the seismic sense, the sense of feeling the seismic activity of the planet in real time. So in order to do that, I have two couple of implants in my, in my feet that are connected to 
online seismographs. So every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the planet, I feel a vibration inside my body. So now I'm here in Montenegro, but if there's an earthquake in California or in Japan or in Greece, I would feel a vibration inside my feet. And depending on the intensity of the earthquake, the vibration I feel is stronger or less strong. So at the beginning, I had to get used to feeling all these vibrations constantly inside my body. But now, after a while, well, maybe in the middle of the night, I would wake up at the beginning. Or when I was talking, I would like stop and be very distracted. But now, a, a part of my, of my body, of my perception. Usually, a good way to describe what I feel, it's like I feel like I have two heartbeats now, like my own and the earth beat, having its own rhythm inside my body. I realized that how alive the earth is, it's very different to know that the earth is moving and actually to feel it, to feel that the tectonic plates are constantly giving vibrations and the earth is also a living organism. And we see this as cyborg art. The creation of a new sense would be our, our artwork. So I guess in cyborg art, artists no longer need to use technology as a tool. We can use technology as part of our body. So the artwork of a cyborg artist would be the creation of a new sense. So my, the seismic sense is my artwork, but it's an artwork that happens inside the artist. So in cyborg art, the, the artist, the art, and the space where it happens, it's all in the same, in the same person. It's a bit like, like the, and then we, we decide if, how we want to reveal our experience. It's a bit like a photographer, no? When someone takes a picture, they see how one, how they want to take the picture, and then they decide how to reveal this picture, if they want to reveal it at all. So in cyborg art, it's a bit the same. We change our perception of reality, we experience the artwork, and then we decide how, how we want to share this. And some ways that I have to share it, it's through a dance piece that it's called Waiting for Earthquakes, where it's like a, a waiting room where the audience and I just wait for an earthquake to take place. Yeah, the, the music can go with that. So in this piece, it's a bit like a waiting room, like the audience and I just wait for an earthquake to take place. It's usually like in a museum, so it's like a living sculpture. And then whenever there's an earthquake, uh, I move according to the intensity of the earthquake. So it's a piece based on real time, so it can last 10 minutes or it can last hours. And, and it's a bit like, yeah, so it, during the performance, if there, has, there are no earthquakes, there will be no dance. So some festivals sometimes are worried about this, but there's always some uh, seismic activity in the planet, so shouldn't be worried. And yeah, it's a bit like a duet between the Earth and myself. The Earth is, is the choreographer of the piece, and I'm just interpreting the data that she gives me. Another, w <coughs> Another way that I have to share this is through seismic percussion. So in that case, the rhythm of the piece is based on the rhythm that the tectonic plates have been moving. So I have two ways of doing this. One is like to play in, in real time. So depending on how much activi seismic activity there is in that moment, the piece changes. And also I create a scores ba based on the seismic activity that ha happened in a specific place. For example, the last that I did, it was in Athens. It's actually very, very, it was like the most uh, seismic score that, that I had to do. It's like, it, it moves a lot, Greece. And I, I researched all the earthquakes that are happening in Greece in the last 50 years, and I put them all together in 10 minutes. So people from Greece could hear how their country has been moving in the last, in the last 50 years through a 10 minutes uh, percussion piece. Um, yeah, my current project actually is also, I also want to be a central out and feeling, I'm feeling a space while I'm in Earth. So my current project is to connect to the seismic activity of the moon, the moon quakes. The moon also shakes, it shakes for different reasons, but there's also seismic, uh, there's also movement there. So when I, so my plan is to connect to the seismic activity of the moon and this will allow me to be physically on Earth, but having my feet on the moon. So. And I, we, also, I, we also call this to be ascension, to feeling, um, uh, the feeling a space while we are on Earth. Yeah, in 2010, Neil and I founded the Cyborg Foundation, basically with three aims. One is to help humans to become cyborgs. The other one is to, to promote cyborg art as an artistic movement. And the other one is to defend the cyborg rights, to defend the right of being able to design yourself, your own body parts and your own perception of reality. 
Yes, some of the projects we've done with the Cyborg Foundation is, uh, for example, I have a tooth missing, so I wanted to have it replaced with something else that it wasn't just a tooth. So we created a tooth with a light inside, so that in case of total darkness, you can click and then you have emergency light inside your mouth. So it's a light tooth that allows you to create light in total darkness. The problem is that when you eat, that light goes on and off, so we're trying to find a system that won't uh, activate the light with the... With the yeah, this is the light tooth. So when you click, you activate the light, but uh, we're trying to find new systems without the click. Another project we've done is magnetic hair implants, so you can have hair implants that actually moves depending on the magnetism around you. So if you walk uh, past uh, a refrigerator, the hairs will definitely go to the fridge because there's a lot of magnetism, but this can help you detect if something is magnetic or not. So it gives you magnetoception. Also another project we both did in Brazil is uh, a tooth was installed in my mouth and another tooth was installed in Moon's mouth. And then whenever I click, she receives a vibration in her mouth and whenever she clicks, I receive a vibration in my mouth because the tooth have a, has a button and a vibrator. So uh, we both know the Morse code, so depending on how we... Depending on the rhythm, we can actually talk from mouth to mouth, sending Morse code words from mouth to mouth. So we call this a transdental communication system because it allows us to talk from mouth to mouth without having to use eyes, ears, or touch. It actually works through Bluetooth, so it's a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate from <laughs> mouth to mouth. It's a communication system that would work in space or under the water, because you don't have air conduction in space or under the water, so it's a communication system that would work in these two places. The other project I'm doing it to myself is the uh, creation of the sense of time. It will be implanted between the skin and the bone, and it's a point of heat that will slowly go around the head, so it's a point of heat that will do the complete circle around my head, and I will feel what time it is depending on the point of heat. So if I feel the point of heat here, it means it's 12 o'clock solar time in London. This is Iceland, this is the Atlantic, this is New York. So slowly I will have a perfect sense of time. So the aim of it is in the future, when my brain gets used to it, see if I can actually modify my perception of time. If I want the situation to last longer, I will program the heat to go a bit slower so that I feel that time is stretching. Or if I want time to go faster, I'll make the point of heat go a bit faster. So my aim is to take Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice and see if we can modify our perception of time if we have an organ for the sense of time. I think it should be possible because in the same way that we can create optical illusions because we have an organ for the sense of sight, we should be able to create time illusions if we have an organ for the sense of time. If it works, this could change our perception of time. We could modify it. We can also change our perception of age. If you want to uh, live 200 years, you can either change your body or change your mind. You could make your mind believe that you've lived 200 years when you are actually just 70 years old. So my aim is to see if this is possible and I'm starting it this year. Yeah, this is uh, Manel, we, our friend also, and he wants to feel, he, he feels that atmospheric pressure through the ears. So through the atmospheric pressure, you can know if it's gonna rain or if it's gonna be sunny. So he feels the weather through vibrations in his ear. So he's actually the, the weatherman. He can feels. He has the barometric sense. Yeah, barometric ears. Uh, we, we, together with Manel, Nina and I, we founded la, uh, last December the Transpecies Society. And it's like the social project of the SIA Foundation, where this is a community that we have in, in Barcelona. So now people can become members of this Transpecies Society. And we div, uh, we give voice to the people that don't feel 100% human. Actually, Neil and I don't feel 100% human because we have new senses and new body parts that are no longer defined as a human sense and a human body part. So we feel like we are transspecies, we're transforming our species. And we actually like the, the logo of the transspecies society because it's not a closed circle and we, we feel that humans are not uh, a closed circle. We are we are an open circle that we can take part of this transformation. We can we can uh, now evolve during our lifetime and decide how we want to perceive reality. We well, you know, yeah, we're doing different projects at the Transpecies Society, and uh, you can follow us on on Instagram or Facebook, and we keep posting what we are doing. We're doing the air quality sense, the cosmic ray sense, and other senses uh, that will be added to different people. 
um, the last implant we did to ourselves was last uh, weekend. We had a, a chip implant, well, well, it's a sensor that vibrates whenever, um, well, it's like a compass, uh, a compass to feel the magnetic fields of the earth that are implanted, uh, it's implanted behind our legs. It was implanted behind Manel, Moon, and myself, and this should awake our sense of magnetic field. There's many species that can feel the north because they have uh, magnets in their body, so we're trying to see if by adding a compass inside our body, we will start feeling the magnetic field of the earth, and we will uh, feel the poles of the earth. This is an, an experiment that we just started last week. Just to end, I think we are all trans species in a way. We've always been in transformation. We've not been human all along. We started by being bacteria in the ocean and then we became another species and we lived on the trees. Now we call ourselves humans, but now we are merging with technology and this gives us the possibility of decide what senses and organs we want to be or have, what senses and organs we want to have as a species. So we can actually start deciding what species we want to be. And this is a huge change that we will start seeing this century, how we can decide how we want to sense reality. So we invite you to think about which senses you, you would like to have. Uh, we think it's ethical to do this because we are a species that for thousands of years have been designing the planet in order to survive. Uh, we think it's, this is wrong. We should be designing ourselves in order to survive. If we all had night vision, we wouldn't have to use artificial light. So cities would be dark uh, and this wouldn't be so uh, harmful for the planet. If we could all control our own temperature, we wouldn't use air conditioning or heaters, we wouldn't change the temperature of the planet. So the more we design ourselves, the less we'll have to change the planet. So we think that in the future, people will see it more ethical to design oneself, because the more we design ourselves, the less we'll have to change the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you.